Hello, good afternoon guys. Today, we will be talking about types of chemical bonds. Okay, so first, let us know what is a chemical bonding. So, let's consider things we see on our daily life like salt, common sugars like glucose and water. Salt is made from two atoms of sodium and chlorine. Glucose is made up of three atoms like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. While water is made up of two atoms, hydrogen and oxygen. Of course, we already know this. Now, let me ask you, what are holding sodium and chlorine to form salts? Okay, the answer is, they are held by attraction force between atoms, ions, or molecules called chemical bonds to form chemical compounds. Therefore, we can say that chemical bonds exist between sodium and chlorine to form salt between carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen to form glucose, and between hydrogen and oxygen to form water. We can compare chemical bonds into cement. It can hold two bricks together to form a concrete wall. So, imagine nyo yung dalawang hollow blocks. Akit nga ba tayo nakakabuo ng dingding? Diba? Imagine yung cemento na nag-hold dun sa dalawang hollow blocks is yung chemical bond. So, ganun yung mechanism ng chemical bonding. Okay? So, there are several types of chemical bond and the first is ionic bond. Okay, it happens when metal atom loses electrons to non-metal atom. And then we have hydrogen bond. Hydrogen attracts an electronegative atom electrostatically. Covalent bond, on the other hand, is when two non-metal atoms share electrons. And then we have metallic bond wherein positive metal ions attract conducting electrons. So now, uh, let's go back with the meaning of chemical bond. So last recorded lesson, we have learned that during bonding, we have to follow the octet rule to have a stable molecule. Ano ulit kasi yung octet rule? Diba yun yung ability of an atom or the characteristic of an atom to carry 8 valence electron, right? In order for it to be called stable. Okay, so let's talk about ionic bond. What is ionic bond? Okay. Ionic bond exists between metals and non-metals. For example, our salt, our sodium, and our chlorine. Okay? And then we have covalent bond. What is covalent bond? Covalent bond exists between non-metals. Okay? Example of that is water. And then we have metallic bond. It exists between metals. From the word itself, metallic, it exists between metals. What is an example of that? is gold, iron, and etc. So, what do you think is the strongest bond? Say, for example, in covalent compounds like diamond and ionic compounds like salt. Diamond has a melting point of 4,027 degrees Celsius while salt has 801 degrees Celsius. Which of them has a higher melting point? Okay? So, when you say melting point, yun yung temperature na kayang i-reach ng isang bagay bago siya matunaw. So, dito, may kita natin na ang melting point ng diamond is napakahigit na mataas kesa sa melting point ng asin. Okay? So, kung makikita nyo rito na ang sagot is covalent bond. Why? Because in bonding, okay, masasabi mong mas mataas yung um, yung, boil, yung boiling point or yung melting, melting point mas strong yung bond na nagahawak sa kanya. Okay? So, when you think about what is the strongest bond, let's consider their melting point. If the melting point is higher, then of course, it is stronger than the other element. When you say stronger, mas matibay yung bond kasi mas, mas malaking amount of heat ang kailangan para matunaw or masira yung bond na yun. Do we get that? Okay. So, now, let's talk about chemical nomenclature. In chemical nomenclature is a set of rules to generate systematic names for chemical compounds. Okay, so we will be talking about some strategies for us to easier name certain compounds. Okay? So, compound can either be covalent or ionic here. Okay? In covalent, molecules use Greek prefixes. What are those Greek prefixes? 
Those are your mono, your di, your tetra, your tri, your hepta, and so on and so forth. While under covalent, we have our acids, okay? We just change the suffix of ionic names. On the other hand, ionic has polyatomic law ions that includes metals with invariant oxidation state or those that has charge and our binary compounds that includes our metals with variable oxidation state or charge. So, what is binary ionic compounds? Binary ionic compounds are composed of a single metal ion and a single non-metal ion. Okay, keep in mind that a metal ion is called a cation, and a non-metal ion is called an anion. Different elements can have different charges. Now, take a look at your periodic table. You can easily remember those by um, taking away the transition metals for a while. So, it should be looking like this. To easily remember that, let's put this here, okay? So, group 1 is 1 plus. Group 2 is 2 plus. And group 3 is 3 plus. While group 5 is 3 minus. Group 6 is 2 minus. And group 7 is 1 minus. Noble gases are exempted since they are uh, already stable. Or they have 8 complete valence electrons. If you can remember that in our previous lesson. Okay? Transition metals can have multiple charges. And you can look at this table. Okay. So, transition metals, on the other hand, kasi dinisregard natin sila, so paano natin sila papangalanan? Okay? So, transition metals, on the other hand, have multiple charges, and you can look at this table for a complete list of their most common charges. Like chromium, it has two isotopes, which is the chromium-2, chromium-3. Okay, chromium-2, when you write that, it should be read as chromius. And the chromium-3, when you write their name, okay, it shall be called chromic. And cobalt, that has uh, isotopes 2 and 3, okay, it is called cobaltus, if it is 2 or 2 plus. And then cobaltic, if it, it has 3 plus electrons. And copper, okay, copper-1, cuprous, copper-2, that has 2 charge, cupric. Lead, okay? Lead 2 and lead 4, plumbus, and then plumbic. Okay, so mercury, mercury 1, mercurius, mercury 2, mercuric. Tin 2, tin 4, okay, that is called stannous or stannic. And then iron, uh, iron 2, and iron 3, ferrous and ferric respectively. Okay, so ito lang naman ang kailangan yung i-memorize. So in naming compounds, uh, you regret to say, kailangan nyo i-memorize tong table na to. Ha? So, para sa exam, uh, you know how to name them. Okay? Okay. Ions form ionic compounds to become neutral or in simpler words, the charges must add up to zero. Sodium is 1 plus and chloride is 1 negative. So, one of each makes the charge of sodium chloride equal to zero. Paano naging zero? Okay? So, ice here. Okay? Okay. So, sodium is 1 plus. And then, our chloride is negative 1. Or 1 negative. If you add 1 and negative 1, that's equals to 0. Right? Okay. Siguro naman, nagkawa nyo na yun, no? So, their charges when add up has to give us zero. Okay. Okay, how about calcium chloride? Okay, calcium, if you're going to look at your table of elements, it has two plus or it falls under the category of two plus column. So it needs two chloride ions. Well, chloride, remember. If you're going to look at your table, okay, it has one negative, right? Okay, so two plus, when you add it with two times negative one, that's equal to zero, okay? So I hope we all get this, okay? 
Okay. How about a naming and writing binary ionic compounds? There are certain rules to follow para mas madaling silang mapangalanan. Number one is write the cation as it is. If your cation is transition metal, use the suffix us when it has a lower charge and ik for higher charge. And then number two, write the anion with the suffix id regardless of the cation is a transition metal or not. So in writing chemical formula, number one, we get the charge of all atoms involved. Number two, we crisscross the charges of the two atoms to become the subscript of the other atom. If the new subscript is one, do not write anymore. Okay? So, hindi mo makikita yung Na1Cl1, di ba? We just write it as NaCl, right? Okay, so number three, keep the subscript to the lowest possible ratio. So, you have to round or, for example, our sodium chloride, Sodium has 1 plus and then chloride has 1 negative, okay? So, when we crisscross it, it became like this, okay? On your screen, here, diba? So, there, mapupunta siya dito. Ito, mapupunta siya dito, okay? So, of course, you do not write, okay? When the charge is, or when the net charge is um, 1 here, 1. Hindi na natin siya kailangan isulat. You don't have to write that already. Okay? You just write it as NaCl. Okay? So, how about in potassium oxide? Okay? In potassium oxide, potassium is 1 plus and oxygen is 2 minus. So, when we crisscross them, okay, potassium will have 2 and then oxygen will have 1. So, remember, we do not write 1 anymore. Okay, we do not write 1 anymore. So, we write it just as K2O. Okay? So, when we deal with transition metals that can have multiple charges, okay, like ferric oxide or our ferrous oxide or FeO, okay, we know that iron is 3 plus from the Roman numeral and oxygen is a 2 minus so when we crisscross it it becomes like this we also have ferrous oxide or iron 2 oxide okay so we we cross we crisscross it again it becomes like this okay the charge here will go there and then the charge here will go there okay so if we are going to simplify it to the lowest possible ratio of course we have to simplify it divided by 2 silang dalawa of course we will now have 1 so hindi na natin siya isusulat diba kasi 1 we don't have to write 1 anymore so we will just write it as feo okay so that is ferrous oxide so ganun lang yon kung divisible naman siya it is possible to uh, round it to the lowest possible ratio okay how about naming binary covalent compound so first, let us know what is a binary covalent compound. Binary covalent compounds composed of two nonmetals. Less electronegative nonmetal comes first, followed by the more electronegative nonmetal. So you have to review our last lesson. If you can remember our previous lesson, we have learned that uh, periodic trends, we said that the less electronegative elements should be closer to the left and bottom of the periodic table. For example, if we have phosphorus and oxygen, phosphorus should come first since it is closer to the bottom and left side of the periodic table. The concept is pretty similar with ionic compounds but we do not determine the charges anymore and instead, we put prefixes before elements. Here are the prefixes we will be using. Okay? So, we use the mono if we have 1, di if we have 2, tri if we have 3, tetra if we have 4, penta if we have 5, hexa if we have 6, hepta if we have 7, octa if we have 8, and nona if we have 9. And of course, deca if we have 10. Now, let's try naming binary covalent compounds. Okay? So, from formula, name. 
First, we get subscripts of the two nonmetals, then put them as a prefixes before the name of the elements. Second, we put the suffix "-ide", to the last element. From name to formula naman, okay, pabalik tad. First, we write to the two nonmetals as chemical symbols. Then second, we get the prefixes, then find their numerical values. Those values will be the subscripts for the two elements, okay? So, if you are given the chemical formula and asked to name the compound, you get the subscript of the two atoms and put that as prefixes before each element. Take note that in the first element, we can put any prefix except for mono and for the second element, we can put any prefix we need. After putting the prefixes, the last element gets the suffix "-ide", like what we do in ionic compounds. Let's have CO as an example. We know that if there is no subscript, it is automatically 1. Again, mono can't be used for the first element. So in CO, we put carbon as it is and then the prefix mono for the oxygen with the suffix "-ide", to become the carbon monoxide. Another example, we have N2O3. Nitrogen has 2, so it becomes dinitrogen. And oxygen has 3, so it becomes trioxygen. But... We add the suffix "-ide", so the whole compound is dinitrogen trioxide. Okay? So, let's have a third example with CCl4. Carbon remains as it is, and of course, chlorine has the subscript 4. We put the prefix tetra, and then the suffix "-ide", to chlorine, so the whole compound becomes carbon tetra chloride. Now, if you are given the chemical name and asked to convert it to chemical formula, it is actually easier. We must just write the two elements as chemical symbols. And then have the prefixes as subscripts. For example, we have carbon dioxide. We know that carbon is 1 and oxygen is 2 from the prefix. So, we write it like this. CO2. Okay? Another example is sulfur. Hexabromide. Sulfur has no prefix so that is written as SBR6. Hexabromide because we have 6. Okay? We can see here in the formula that SBR is subscripted with 6. So we write it as sulfur hexabromide. And the final formula should look like this. Our last example is the trophosphorus the coxide. So how do we write S? So don't get confused. This is just phosphorus and oxygen. Okay? Para ang gulo, no? It says tetraphosphorus decoxide. Ang haba. But if you're just going to write it, it is just written as PO. Okay? Or phosphorus and oxygen. Why? Phosphorus has the prefix tetra. So we know that its subscript should be 4. And don't oxygen has the prefix deca. So its subscript should be 10. Now, we write the final formula as this, P4O10. Bakit? Kasi tetra means 4 and deco, diba? It means 10. So, apat na phosphorus, tetra phosphorus, sampung oxygen, decoxide. Okay? So, don't be confused. Okay, let's move on to the next lesson. It is naming monoatomic and polyatomic ions. So, remember that ions are atoms or compounds with a charge. It can be positive or a negative charge, but either one makes an ion. There are simple monoatomic ions and there are more complex polyatomic ions. Monoatomic ions are single atoms with a positive or negative charge from a loss of or gain of one or more electrons. Here are some examples of monoatomic ions. There is actually a really easy way to figure out that ions that form from the representative elements, you just use the periodic of elements. Column 1 become plus 1, and column 2 plus 2 cations, and column 13 become plus 3 cations. Now, carbon could act as a cation or an ion with a plus or minus 4, but it is usually doesn't form ions. would prefer to make covalent bonds. Column 15 becomes minus 3 anions. 
column 16 become minus 2 anions and column 17 becomes minus 1 anions. Transition metals forms cations. Transition metals can have more than one possible charge. So first, you have to know the name of the chemical you are using. The symbol for transition metal ion will have the charge but there are multiple possible charges in the stock name. You use a Roman numeral to note the charge of the ion. So we use Roman numeral to note the charge of the ion. Okay, so the classical name is not often used, but you may hear it occasionally, especially from the older college's professor, okay, na mas mas na ahead sa akin because they still use it. Words like cupric ion or cuprich ion, you whether it's the higher or lower, but you have to remember which is which. The stock names are clearer. So, ikaw, if you, which you do you prefer? So, we would say lead 2 and lead 4 ions or mercury 2 ion, which is also happens to be a diatomic elemental ion. Now, polyatomic ions are composed of more than one atom, like sulfate, hydroxide, bosphite, and ammonium ions. They are tightly bound by covalent bonds and behave as one unit that carries a charge. Most of the polyatomic ion names end in 8, which are deoxyan ions, and ite, which is some polyatomic ions that ends in ide. It means less than 8 means more, which is in reference to the number of oxygen atoms in the ion. Now, let's take a look of the list of some common polyatomic ion names here. Okay? They are sorted by their charge. The top section are all minus 1 anions. Then the charge increases down the chart. Everything in this chart is an anion except for the cation, the ammonium ion, or the NH4+. Okay, so that's all. I hope you have learned something in this chapter, this very long chapter. Okay, so please answer the activities that will be posted uh, below this video. Also, enjoy the rest of the day and good luck for the coming midterms. Okay, see you after Squaa. Bye!